morning's message, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? So many people are saying so many things in this world today, and there are people going to God in prayer, and God is asking the question back. One of the very first messages that God gave me to preach came out of the book of Job, chapter 5, beginning verse 6. He says, Although affliction cometh not forth of the dust, neither doth trouble spring out of the ground. Yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. That was probably the first message that I had on the radio when I was preaching in Nashville, Tennessee. Many times, more so than not, some of the problems that we're having, if not the bulk of all the problems we have, is because of some of the things that we do. And one of the things that God is looking at in the book of Job, chapter 38, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Now let me tell you something. I wrote a, a, a song years ago before I ever preached this first message. I was in Knoxville, Tennessee in a jail cell when I wrote this song. And you know, what will you do? Where will you be when it's all over? Will you look upon it all for signs and wonders? Or will you see what God has really done? See, a lot of people looking to God for, oh, well, I want to see you walk on water again. I want to see you heal the sick. I want to see you raise the dead. I want to see this and I want to see that. But in the book of Job, chapter 38, and verse 2, he says, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? You see, what you're doing, you're actually pushing away the truth so that you can believe the lie. You're actually using the truth as, a, as something to stand on to prove something that you really want yourself. And Job wanted something from the Lord and Job was all right with God and he was being a, a, a good man, an upright man and such, but Job had a lot of confidence in his works. And God had to show him who are you that's going to ask me these questions? If you read beginning in the 38th chapter of the book of Job, God, God gives him like he's on trial. He says, who are you that's asking me? Where were you when I did this? Where were you when I did that? And uh, it would have scared me to pieces if I was standing before God and he asked me some of the questions that he asked Job. I'll be honest with you, you know, I don't have the answers. I mean, where do I keep the snow when it's not snowing? How come the how come the oceans don't get no higher? And I said a bound for them, they said, This is as far as you're gonna go, and no further shall you go, and the only barrier that I put there is sand. <laughs> Think about it. God says something that's gonna happen the way he says it. Many men and women in our churches are guilty of not just not doing the word of God, but they're actually blaspheming the word of God because of the lifestyle that they're living. <coughs> in Titus chapter 2 and verse 1, listen to what the, the Bible through the Holy Ghost is speaking here. Paul's letter to Titus. He says in verse 1, But speak thou the things which become a sound doctrine. Boy, people teaching everything but sound doctrine today. He says that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as become of holiness, not false accusers, not given of much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Look at there. People who are doing what they're doing today are actually blaspheming the word of God. They're committing sins upon sins upon sins after God. And they're claiming to be Christians. How can this be? Now, I've heard it said that 
Nations may be governed by men, but women are the rulers. So this morning I want to speak to some of the rulers out there. Whether you're a man or a woman that's claiming to be the ruler this morning, I want to talk to you this morning. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 1 he says, But speak thou the thing which become a sound doctrine. Now the word sound means what? Healthy? Uncorrupted? True? Why are they preaching all these other things that ain't healthy? That's, that's a mess. And a lot of the stuff we see people saying and doing just aren't true. You know? Look carefully at the scripture. Notice that sound doctrine includes what? Teaching women to be obedient to their own husbands? That's sound doctrine? Sound doctrine includes teaching women to be keepers at home? Sound doctrine includes being chaste and discreet? Sound doctrine includes teaching women to love their husbands? Let me tell you something. Our churches are flooded with unsound doctrine these days. You know that as well as I do. It's got a lot of unsound doctrine today. Because they're not following this list. They got women out there preaching. They got pastors who, who do everything what their wives tell them to do. And if they don't, their wives will let them know they're not doing it. Big time. You know, I'm not saying that they're perfect. But I'm saying that there are some problems. And we need to look at the problem. And then it's time that we look around our world and accept our moral obligation to God. We're polluting God's earth that he has given us charge over. We're just... We're just throwing stuff out there. I come to church this morning and I see all these people burning wood and stuff in this day and age. You know what? Hey, that's fine. If that's what you want to do. Burn wood to heat your house. I know you've got to have something to heat it. What are you going to have? If we use gas, uh, we're, going to, we're going to pollute it. Huh? But look at there's so many of us now. The earth is not small like it was years ago and we can do anything and, and, and the tears... The rain tears of God could come down and uh, clean the earth up. Well, there's so much going on now, it can't get clean. So then if it doesn't get the air clean, you understand why we've had all the rain lately? Because God is trying to cleanse our air. Because it's, it's, it's time that it, it, we're going to have to do something. And God's going to hold us accountable for what we're doing. You know? And so I think we need to... Uh, uh, Look at what we're doing. Like some of the rest of the world have this Paris Peace uh, uh, Climate Agreement. Well, I'm not saying that we're under a dire climate change, but look at the air that we're having to breathe. Maybe we haven't changed the, the climate yet. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a scientist and I'm not figuring on that, but I, I know when I was in California with my wife and I believe Hank was out there with us, yeah, we had stepped out of our apartment that we had uh, that we lived in out there and we'd step out of that apartment to go out and get the car to go to work and it would be like once you open the door to your home it would be like sticking a tailpipe up your nose I mean if you could look off in the distance you couldn't see 30, 40 feet in front of you there was so much pollution and, and, and it made your eyes squint because it was so bad and all that was coming from automobile vehicles you know automobiles and trucks and stuff because at the time, California didn't have all these manufacturing plants like we have in Michigan and Pittsburgh and such. And so, we need to take a look at what we're doing. In the book of Genesis, God gives us all a job. Why are we not doing the job that God has given us, you know? I've had women tell me that God didn't give them a job. Well, I beg your pardon, if you read the book of Genesis chapter 3, you know, he says differently from what you're saying. God has given you a job. And having this job from God, we should, we should all be good stewards of this earth that God has given us to live on. And it is not only our responsibility for the planet, but you know what? We need to take care of what we have. If you've got your home and you're not taking care of it, after a while you're not going to have a home because the roof's going to leak and it's going to fall in. After a while, the floors are going to water away, rot away, and it's going to fall in. 
You don't take care of your home, you're not going to have a home. You don't take care of this planet that God has given us, or this earth that God gives us. He doesn't call it a planet, he calls it earth. Because he says the dry land he calls earth, and the waters he calls sea, in the book of Genesis chapter 1. So we need to take responsibility. Electric cars are one of the ways that we can take to help our children's children is coming along. Because if we continue on polluting the way we are and not caring about what happens, they're not going to have any air to breathe. You know, I think uh, you think that we're given dominion over this earth. Well, does it mean also that we should have responsibility over it? If God gives us dominion over everything upon this earth, isn't that like a responsibility to take care of it? So think about what you're doing. The Bible tells us in Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. You know, the servants of God are those who walk humbly upon the earth, and they walk softly. You know, if you're walking out here and you're, you're not walking very softly, you're not walking with, with God. You're just stirring up a bunch of trouble. To walk softly means to do what God says to do, to walk humbly with Him, to do justly, to love mercy. And how many of us are doing that? Think about how you're living your life and what you're doing and what people think about you. And where are they drawing their conclusions from? How you live in your life? Well, walking humbly or softly upon the earth means not ruining what God has entrusted to our care, doesn't it? And if we're constantly going to ruin it, I understand that there's a, there's a barrier in someone having an electric car today because it costs a little more. But that's for Newman. You can buy a used one almost at the same price you can buy a used automobile. Just about the same thing. There's very little difference except on the amount of gas you're going to have to put in it. Now, we drive our, our Chevy Volt, okay, with a V. We drive it from our home out here, it's 26, 27, 28 miles, whatever, uh, out here to church, and then we plug it in, and then we drive it back home. So, mostly all the local running we do, we drive off electricity. We don't use any gasoline. Well, that's helping the environment for one, but forget about the environment. Look how it's helping our bill flow. You know? We don't have to go to the gas station as often. And here in the future, gas is really going to skyrocket. You can believe that because Trump just had this uh, end, uh, thing now in November the 5th. And guess what? He, he, he put them sanctions back on Iran. And, and he, any country that exports uh, gas to, from Iran to anywhere in the world, they're going to be an enemy of the United States. And the United States is not going to do business with them. And so what's that going to do? There's a million uh, uh, barrels of oil that's not going to be put into the oil market. So you know what's going to happen? We're going to be running low on oil here for long. You're going to be paying 5 and $6 a gallon for oil in the next few months. And I'm not just saying it, just be saying it. And some of you are going to be walking. I'm still going to be driving my electric car. Because I can make it to church, and I can charge here and make it all the way back home. In the summertime, I can drive to church and back. Because my car will register right at 50 miles in the summertime. In the wintertime, it will get about 36, 37. But, oh, well, if I don't run the heat, it might do better. But I run the heat coming out. <laughs> you know, walking on earth humbly means walking softly. Not running. Walking softly. And it means doing what he instructs us to do, not just having an electric car. There's more to it than that. I mean, my goodness, look at the things that you can do at home. How, you, how you've taken care of your home. How you've taken care of what's outside of your home. You remember I tell you before, preaching up here, you can tell what a person's house looks like on the inside by what you see on the outside a lot of times, if not all the time. But they got a mess laying all around the house on the outside, you can bet they got a mess inside. And so if they got a mess inside and outside the house, guess what? They got a mess in their life too. Because it all works hand in hand. If you got a mess in your life, you got a mess with God. If you got a mess with God, you got a problem. 
And so you, you start to clean up your mess with God and everything else is going to get cleaned up along with it. So if you haven't cleaned up your mess around your house, because you haven't cleaned up your mess with God. So think about what you're doing. You know, when God created Adam, the Bible says he breathed in him the breath of life. So then, to be able to breathe is life then, isn't it? If you don't breathe, you're going to be dead then, right? Hmm? You won't be living, it's a simple thing. We all need to breathe. And it's absolutely wrong that in the wealthiest country in the world, there are places here in America that the air is so dangerous to breathe that it's not safe. Just drive up past some of these plants sometimes headed for wheeling. And, and, and see if you want to stand outside of some of them plants all day long. I wonder what it's going to cause to the inside of you if you can smell that mess on the outside. What's it going to do to parts of us that we don't know and we can't see? Revelation chapter 16, please. Verse 17 says, And the seventh angel poured out his vow into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven and from the throne, saying, It is done. There were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, such as not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and, the, and Babylon, great Babylon, came in remembrance before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. What's God doing? He's messing up the air, huh? The angel poured as the angel pollution? Is that what it is? Huh? And they're calling it the angel of God? Is that what the Bible's trying to tell us? Or is God doing it? It says every island fled away and the mountains were not found. There fell upon men a great hell out of heaven, every stone about the weight of the talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hell, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Now what if all this fracking they're doing here in West Virginia causes this great earthquake? What if they, all this fracking they're doing, they open up some kind of fissure in the earth and even more stuff comes out of it, like a smoking furnace? What if that happens to us and we're just sitting idly by not doing what God wants us to do? Where are we going to be then? There's no more air to breathe. You're not going to be living. That's where you're going to be. There's a price to be paid if we refuse to do what God has instructed us to do. God has given us a free will. So we have to decide, are we going to do what God says or are we going to do it our way? You know, when you decide to have it your way and die, that you're going to die before your time. Instead of what God wants us to do is live to a good old age. You know, the sinful nation that women should pursue careers and postpone motherhood, well, that's against the Word of God, isn't it? Because it says that the younger women are supposed to be discreet, chaste, keepers of the home. Now, how are these younger women putting their children in nurseries and all these other things doing what God's Word says? You know, what about the notion that women should be preachers, pastors, presidents? All this is contrary to the Word of God. And yet we see it going on, don't we? You know, the blaspheme here means to vilify, speak irreverently, or do what you want instead of what God says to do. That means you're placing your will above God's will. Vilifying His words as inferior to your own plans and your own intentions. So God's word is like it's, it's bad, it's mean, because it makes women do this and they don't want to do it. It makes men do this that they don't want to do. That makes God being bad. And this is what they were trying to say uh, uh, when, when they were talking about these Satan worshippers, that Satan was the, was the God that came and gave us liberty because Satan told us we could do what we wanted to do. And the whole sum of the law was do what thou wilt. Have it your way. The whole sum of the law is have it your way is what they're saying. In Mark chapter 9 and verse 42, and Jesus says, Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, 
It is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were cast into the sea. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life made than to having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. In verse 44 of Mark chapter 9, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter in, enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Now, I don't know where all these people get this thing that hell is going to, you're going to be burnt up and that's going to be the end of it. Because that's not the teaching of the Bible. The teaching of the Bible says it's going to last forever. Forever. That means it's never going to have an end to it. He says, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched again in verse 46. If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Now how many times does the Lord have to tell us something? Not very many times, huh? I heard a TV commercial here recently. There's a man commenting about his sister. He said it was awesome to see her transform from a girl in a small town into a soldier. I asked you this morning, what was he doing sitting home while his sister joined the army? Hmm? What was he doing sitting at home while his sister joined the army? Think about it. We're seeing housemen now and not housewives. These commandments that God gave, he, he said, let the women. He didn't say the men to be chaste keepers at home. He said for the women to be that. So what makes these men that think they're preachers and all these other things that they are, and yet they don't want to work their jobs? They want to just sit at home. What makes them think they're something else? You know, I think it's not right. You know, the Bible teaches for women to be keepers at home, not the men. There's no place in Christianity for this kind of thinking. There's no place in Christianity for these hussies or dykes or feminists. If you want to go to God's heaven, there's going to have to be a change about you. You can sit here this morning and sleep through the service and learn nothing. Or you can learn something and do something with it. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10, Paul writes to us again, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, not working at all, but our busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Think about how you're living your life. Think about what people that you know of are doing this very day. Please. <laughs> yeah. You may join a false religion, Attend an apostate so-called church, and you may fool yourself into thinking that God is pleased with your sinful ways. But you're only deceiving yourself. You're just deceiving yourself. You want to come to church and you don't want to hear what God has to say, you have deceived yourself. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 7. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. God sees everything that we are doing. You can do what you will, old man, woman, whatever, but God sees everything that you're doing. He is watching us all the time, whether we think it or we know it not. He's watching us all the time. In our Wednesday study, we seen God was coming down, and he talked to Abram, Abraham. And he was leaving Abraham's side and he said, I'm going down to Sodom to see if the cries that come up to me are as bad as what I thought they was. God seen what they was doing in Sodom. He sees what you're doing this morning. 
And if you're not doing the right thing, God sees it, and he is going to be the one that you'll have to deal with. He is watching us all the time. American society is becoming increasingly hostile against the Bible, vilifying the truth. Anytime somebody steps up and says something about the Word of God, somebody wants to say, oh, it ain't this way and it ain't that way. The Bible teaches us that we are to remain sexually pure until marriage. And what are we supposed to do after we're married? Do whatever? No, we're supposed to be the same. And it includes all of us. Sexual immorality brings the wrath and the judgment of God. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5, he says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which sake, things sake, the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. So understand, there's a price to pay with you not doing like you're supposed to be doing. There's a price that you're going to have to pay. Not me, you. In Jude chapter 1 and verse 5, almost at the end of the Bible, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. You don't believe that God will do something to you? You don't have to. You're going to find out what he's going to do to you in due time. And then he says in verse 6, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he had reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of that great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, and going after strange flesh, are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Titus chapter 2 and verse 4. Back into the text of our message this morning. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. This teaches that women are to be what? Obedient to their husbands? A woman who obeys her husband because he tells her not to come to church is blaspheming the word of God, and isn't she? But she stay at home when her husband tells her to, and we're not going to church, and your children aren't going to church. So these people disregard the Bible. They reject it, and they use man's authority for their lives, in their life, in their faith, and in their morals. I wonder how many of these husbands want to take their wives to hell with them. Think about that. How many of them are setting their children up to take to hell with them? Why are they doing this? They want to go to hell? Is that why they're doing it? I believe it is. When women do this, they're doing and listening to their husbands, then they're blaspheming the word of God, aren't they? You can think what you want, like women who filed a divorce, for divorce. They don't love their husbands, and they're blaspheming the word of God. Titus chapter 2 and verse 4 again. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. I can't spell it out any plainer. If you're not doing what the Bible says, you're blaspheming the word of God. <laughs> and where do you think that blaspheme is going to get you? The word discreet means to have or be safe in mind. That is to be self-controlled, moderate. Think about it. Women today are reckless, going from one relationship to another. When a woman says, I'm not in a relationship right now, she means I temporarily quit whoring around for a while. 
temporarily quit pouring around for a while. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 7 says, But as, it, as in the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. As in the days of Noah, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Verse 39, And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus foretold of what the end times would be like. He foretold the end times would be like the wickedness that was going on in the days of Noah, when people were marrying and giving in marriage. They were going from one marriage to another, and another, and another. And they're doing this after they said they were born again Christians. They're still blaspheming the Word of God. People don't try to work out their marriage problems anymore. They just file for divorce and move on. Daniel chapter 5, verse 23. But hath lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee. Thou and thy lords, thy wives and thy concubines, have drunk wine in them. And thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold and of brass and of iron and wood and stone which see not nor hear not. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and who are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. You've spent your time and your money on all these worldly things, and you haven't done nothing with the real God. And he's the one that holds the breath of life in his hand for you. And where are you going to be when he takes that breath away from you? Daniel said it to this wicked king, Belshazzar. He said, The God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. You think about that verse. You can apply that to so many people today. Oh, I'm not going to church, and if they do go to church, they want to sleep through the whole message. Right. The God whose hand that their breath is in, He's going to deal with them, and I don't have to. This describes most of the Americans today. They are arrogant, sinfully, proud, self-willed, lovers of pleasures, lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 19, the Bible says, Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. It's all about living on this earth and doing what I want to do. That's what he says. All these people that's living on this earth saying they're doing what they want to do. Not what God says to do. He says their God is their belly. Just give me something to eat. Make me have pleasure. Let me do this and let me do that. When a woman wears sensual clothing in public, she's blaspheming the word of God. And go to Walmart right now, this afternoon, if you will. And look at the way some of these women are dressed when you go in there. That looks to me like half of them would be dressing like they got something to sell. The Lord gave us his commandments and he instructs us how to live. How to treat each other and how to please him. Yet man is inherently evil and prone to disobedience and wrath. Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9 the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2. Now, everybody wasn't born into this world being a Christian. Everybody was born into this world probably being a sinner. Because the Bible says we all have sinned. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2 he says, Where in time past you walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. What makes you think you're different now just because you come to church? If you're still doing the same thing the unsaved world's doing, what makes you feel like you're different? Most people don't care about the coming judgment that the Bible warns about. Why? 
But most people don't believe the Bible. They don't believe God. They believe in a round globe they call Earth because their teachers taught that to them in school. They don't believe that they're special. They believe that God <coughs> created them over a period of time they call evolution. So they believe in spacemen and all these other things that's going on out there that doesn't exist. <coughs> According to the Bible, there is no space. According to the Bible, you won't find the word space in it. You find the heaven and the earth. You won't find space in the Bible. But what are they talking about then? There's another word that they've invented for themselves? Because if there was space out there, wouldn't have God have told us about it? He said, there's the heavens and the earth. That's what he said. There's the heaven and there's the earth. You know what? Most people have believed the lie that men wrote the Bible to control other men. And they use it as a form of manipulation. That's what they believe. And yet they're being manipulated by these liars and they're being manipulated by the media and everything else out there and they believe that God is wrong and the, and the media is right. How can this be? We have a verifiable divine origin of the Bible. History bears very loud and clear witness that the Bible came into man's possession through a divine and miraculous means. Only somebody that didn't have a lot of sense would look around and wonder how that could be. The wise men who came to see Christ were wise because why? They believed in the Bible? It says in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, But thou, Bethlehem of Euphrates, though be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be a ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. And no man has been everlasting, and had to be the Christ. There's no man, only God could be everlasting. He prophesied that Christ would be born in Bethlehem. That's the prophecy. Matthew chapter 2, verse 5 says, And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, that's where the Messiah is to be born, in Bethlehem, because it was written hundreds, if not thousands of years prior to him coming. And you look upon that and say, oh well, big deal. So yeah, he did it, big deal. And what are you doing when you look on it like that? You're blaspheming the word of God. Even that evil, wicked King Herod was familiar with the prophecy. Though he was wicked and evil and he knew that there was a God, look at what he done. He went out and killed all the babies two years and under to kill the Christ child that he knew was to be the Messiah, the deliverer, the leader of the people. I'm going to kill him. I'm like, sure, I'm going to stop that scripture from happening. So I'm going to defeat God's purpose. Is that what you think you're going to do? Because everybody that goes up against God, blaspheming the word of God. That's what they're doing. Hath not scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? It was Micah to whom the Lord gave this prophecy. Notice what Jesus said in Luke chapter 24. Now Luke only has 24 chapters. And then when we get to verse 25 of Luke chapter 24, Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. What does that put you if you don't believe God this morning? Out of the words of Jesus, where does that put you? O fool, are you a fool this morning? Out of the mouth of Jesus Christ? Think about that. Do you want to be a fool when you stand in front of him and, you, and you're at the point of once to die and then the judgment and you're standing in front of him? He says, you fool. You could have been saved. You went to that church all them years, but what else did you do? Just went and warmed the pew for an hour or two? Thou fool. Slow of heart. God raised up the prophets for a reason. 
to give mankind a voice, to preach the coming of the Messiah, to give us future prophecies of what was going to happen, and to notify us of things that was going down. God gave us prophecy so we could evidence the truth. God gave us a way to prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that God's inspired word is true. So why don't people believe? Jesus said they're fools. That's why they don't believe. They have, they're not here in church this morning because they're fools. John chapter 3 and verse 20 says, For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. If you don't love the Bible, if you don't think God is reasonable, why did the Lord give us so much evidence then? If he didn't want us to prove it. Prove it to yourself that God is true. God is real. You have to accept the evidence that the Lord has brought up. If you don't accept it, where are you going to be? God did everything in such a way that you can doubt if you want. But look at the overwhelming evidence that we have. Jesus called the two men fools for doubting the word of God. They were sorrowful over Christ's death, failing to believe what the prophets had prophesied in the Old Testament. Yeah, they were fools just for doubting about Jesus being raised from the dead. What are you going to be when you stand in front of God and you know all these things that already happened? He said in Acts chapter 10 verse 43, To him give all the prophets witness, that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. How did you get your sins removed? If you didn't believe in him, how did you get your sins removed? Think about where you're at this morning and what you're doing this morning. Have your sins been taken away or are you yet living in your sins? Genesis chapter 15 says, in verse 5, he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now towards heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said to him, So shall thy seed be. And verse 6 says, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it for righteousness. Romans chapter 4, verse 5 but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even so, David describes the righteousness of God, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputed righteousness without works. American women have indoctrinated themselves. I think, because they've been listening to these unsound thinking of some of these feminists where they have rejected God, they've rejected the masculine identity of the fathers, husbands, the Bible, and even God himself. Now they've got a Bible out claiming that it was not Jesus Christ, but Judas Christ. If this isn't blasphemy, I don't know what is. Women are taught not to obey the word of God. They're taught to do their own thing. This, is this not why we have such conflict in our marriages, in our homes, in our churches, in our society? Because feminism is rejecting God's chain of command. American children rule their parents and the women rule over the husbands with the corrupt court system that we have today. Don't be a man go to court with some woman because you're in trouble. The husband's rights are not recognized in our country any longer. Men are at the mercy of a wicked and corrupt system controlled by homosexuals, God-haters, and money-hungry lawyers and swindlers. Divorce has become such a lucrative market in the United States. No doubt some women accuse me of being biased and a male chauvinist. But 
that God knows my heart. The reason why I focus so much on this evil is because it is such a big problem. Why do I do this? God is the final authority. That's why the Bible is our authority. The entire Christian life is a matter of how we are living our lives under God's authority. Satan is the world's authority. The day that the person becomes a Christian, they're now under God's authority instead of Satan's. That's why Jesus referred to the unsaved Jews as being children of the devil. John chapter 8, verse 44. He says, You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Christians are adopted children of God himself. We have been adopted by God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believeth on him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, but we are adopted children of God. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 6, he says, Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You know, if you don't love that, what is it that you do love in this life? If you don't love to come to church and, and praise God and worship the Lord, what is it that you do like? You love the world and everything that's in the world, the world's on its way to hell. Think about it. In Titus chapter 1, he says in verse 10, there are many ruling, unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. Money. That's why they teach you what they teach. Money. Money, money, money. Give me money. That's what I want. That's what they're saying. You know, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said that Christians are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. Paul said this is true. You need to rebuke them sharply so that they may be sound in the faith. You know, down in verse 16, it says they profess that they know God. Are you professing that you know God? But in works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and to every good work reprobate. Where do you lie at this morning? Are you in one of these categories? Unto the pure, verse 15 of Titus chapter 1, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. Even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, unto every good work, reprobate. The Bible is talking about people whose minds are alienated. It's talking about unsaved people who are religious people. They're unsaved, though. And yet they're religious. They're sitting in our churches week after week, and they're not saved. American society gives rights to anyone, whether they're of God or of the devil. They have rights. Most people think that's a good thing, letting people do anything they want. And you might think that's a good thing. You can have your own way of thinking. But with your way of thinking, it always seems to go against God's way of thinking. The freedom to pervert and corrupt society 
as we see it, has done just that. We destroyed ourselves. And now it's coming upon judgment time on planet Earth. And God is going to judge you just like He judges anybody else. You won't get by. The homosexuals' right to sodomize our children has led to a lot of this wickedness that's going on today, perversion of justice, debauchery. And you think God's going to bless this mess? We have all these unchaste women having all these sexual relations out there. And then, what do they do? They have abortions, that's what they do. And so they can continue all these abortions, they continue to have illicit sex, killing their own babies. And when they have to stand in front of God, and God inquires of them how they've lived their life and they've had abortions and stuff, you killed something that I created? Today there's no accountability. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13 says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment, and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. God is going to judge you for your wickedness. You are going to be judged for what you are doing right this very moment. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 35, A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, but an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. What's in your heart this morning? You can say, I, My heart is in it for God, but where's your actions at to prove where you're at? Where's your actions at this morning? Jesus says in verse 36, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Jesus warned you, sound doctrine is actual, accurate, biblical teaching. Sound doctrine teaches that women should dress appropriately. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair, gold, or pearls, or costly array. So I think it's wrong for a woman to wear tight pants, halter tops, low-cut blouses, slaps that are so tight they, re they are revealing. Many women have the attitude that a man that looks on her has a problem. But I assure you that God is going to look upon you for the way you're dressing. God commands you to dress modestly, not immodestly. Any fool would know that sensual and revealing clothing is sinful. Sound doctrine is the truth. The truth is that women who pursue a career over motherhood are vilifying the Word of God. You think that you know more than God? Then you better think again. Children are a gift from the Lord. The Bible says in Psalms 127, verse 3, Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. Abortion is throwing God's gift to the wind. Sound doctrine teaches women to be keepers at home. Not working a career to achieve status, success, or a fortune. I understand that there are women in today that have to work because their husbands can't or won't. But I'm talking about women that's working that should be home with a working husband. They should be home taking care of their family and they're not. We got so much of that going on because they ought to have the bigger house, the more expensive automobile. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, to destroy. I'm promised you might have life and have it more abundantly, but he says, just do my word. You'll have a more 
blessed is life than you ever thought about. Do you believe it sounds off good this morning? Ask yourself that. Or have you believed a lie? Titus chapter 2, verse 1 again, back to our what we started with here this morning. Think about it. Speak thou things which become a sound doctrine. Consider what the Bible teaches you this morning. What are you doing? Sound doctrine is teaching women to love their own husbands, not divorce them, to love their precious children and not abort them. Proverbs chapter 31, over and over, it talks about her home, her house, all the things that she will do in her home. She will do him good, verse 12, and not evil all the days of her life. That's not happening. America is going down the drain so fast that you can't even see correctly. People are irresponsible. They are out of control. Money is what's causing them to do what they're doing. And why? I believe it's because they don't believe in God. Yeah, they may say they believe in God, but they don't really. Because every instance they get, well, God, you said it. Why isn't that happening? Constantly throwing something in God's face. Hebrews 13, verse 5 says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Why aren't you happy with what you have? Why do you have to have so much more? If God has provided you with as much as you have, why aren't you happy with it? Anybody can give up. Anybody can walk away. Anybody can quit. It takes the genuine love of the Lord to hang in there. If you don't have it, you ain't got it. And I can't give it to you. We are all dear to the heart of God. And I'm going to tell you something else. Some of you women haven't figured it out yet. The reason God took a rib from Adam. Think about that. What's a rib cage for? Isn't it to protect the heart? So God took something that was there to protect Adam's heart, something that would be there, and even though it was taken out of him, should it be there also to protect his heart? Think about the responsibility that women, women have today. And what are they doing with it? They're throwing it out the door? Remember me telling you about the three rings in marriage? Hmm? Y'all remember what the three rings in marriage were? Engagement ring, wedding ring, and then the supper ring. The rib is there to protect the tender heart. Are you there to protect the tender heart? The woman wasn't created from, from man's foot, nor his head to rule over him. She was created out of the rib, something to protect his tender heart. If you're embracing feminism as a woman, it's because you're trying to be like a man. And you will be, just a matter of time, because Satan will harden your heart, that you will be just like something that you're not. Sound doctrine teaches women to be sober. That's responsible, temperate, not out of control. Abortion is an act of recklessness. Abortion is an act of your own will over the will of God. I'm going to murder this child. Nearly all the women who seek abortion do so because they were reckless with their body, living in sexual immorality. So many today don't care what the Bible teaches. They could care less what God thinks. A lot of people use an excuse that, well, all these religions and none of them can agree. So how does a person know what to believe? Why are you listening to people? Christianity is all about Jesus. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 19. 
the Bible prophesies and testifies of Jesus Christ and who he is. And if you pervert the scripture, then you've turned the truth of God into a lie. In verse 10, Revelation chapter 19, And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, See thou, do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren, that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Where's all this taking place at? Go back to verse 1 and read it, please. What's happening here? And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation, and glory, and honor, and power unto the Lord of our God. So this morning I'm telling you, or asking you right now, you need to make a decision. What are you going to do with the Christ? Just because you come to church don't mean you're coming to heaven. No, it doesn't. Think about where you're at this morning. Marie, will you give us a song of invitation? 